So welcome everybody. Happy Saturday morning. I hope you are doing well. And I'm going to do another three color challenge because these are great for the brain. And with a three color challenge, you take a pile of whatever you use to do your images with. So it can be acrylic paints or watercolor paints or pencils or watercolor pencils or crayons or pastels, anything at all. And if you don't have anything that has colors, you can do shades of something. So you can use regular pencils and you could do dark sections, middle sections, and light sections. So the idea is to do three random things. It's a little harder if you are doing black and white. But if you have bunches of different charcoals, for example, you might have different shades of gray that you can choose from with watercolors. It's a little easier because I have there we go, have my tin of paints which go with this tin so because it'd be sort of hard to randomly choose from there but it's fairly easy to close your eyes <laughs> and randomly choose some paints from here and for people who are new to watercolors um, you probably are used to getting the pre-made kits from the store that have little circle shapes and you get eight colors or 12 colors or whatever the circle shapes come with. The reason that I moved to using tubes is that if you get the circle shape kit, which I have a lot of them in the house, I don't see any next to me right now, but if you had like the colors of the rainbow and then you happen to use up all the green, now that particular kit is uh, less useful because you need to go buy a whole nother kit to refill the green. If you make your own kit, first you get to choose the colors that you really like to use yourself. And then second, if you run out of green, <laughs> you just buy another green tube or you refill it from the existing green tube you have. And you can always keep the colors in your kit working well. Just noticing that some of the blue fell into my ground. Alright, I'll have to deal with that later. Part of the downside of keeping the paint on the side here as you can see there's a little chip there where some of the blue came loose and fell and it actually fell into there so I think what I'm going to do is wet one of my brushes and just grab out come on here I thought this was going to go grab out a little blue stuff so we don't get blue with our brown Just a little maintenance before I forget. Alright, I think I got most of it. Alright, that'll do. Alright, three color challenge. We've got a bin of colors. I am going to close my eyes. My eyes are completely closed. I cannot see a single thing. I am going to stick my hands into this pile of paints. Find out what I want to grab. Let's grab this one, whatever color this is. You know, I do not know. Where do I want the second color? How about this one? So whatever color that is. All right, one more. Ah, like this one. I'm gonna take this color. All right, I have chosen three colors. How have I done? Oh, did I put the level upside down? Oh, this is a little bizarre. I don't know if this really counts. All right, I've got. Bamboge, which is a lovely orange yellow. I have green light, which is one of my favorite colors in the world. So this is nice. But then I have Chinese white, which I don't really think counts as a color. 
because really that just gives you two colors and then white again. So I'm going to choose another color because I'm not going to count white as a color because <laughs> the paper is white. I will use it, I suppose, although that would be stretchy. No, I'm going to take the white out. Sorry, white. I probably should have taken that out to start with. So the white is out of the thing. So another color. Right? My eyes are closed again. I want a color. I want something from up there. Right down there. What? How about this one? Ooh, cerulean blue. Oh, this is too funny. All right, so the previous times that I've done my three color challenge, I have managed to choose colors that were way, way off from what I normally like to paint with. And that is, of course, part of the challenge, is to think about how you would use those colors. And it's a good exercise to help you expand the type of colors that you work with. But in this particular case, now granted, I don't tend to use the gamboge very much. I tend to use medium yellow. Yeah, pretty much <laughs> I tend to use the medium yellow. It may be a hint of lemon yellow for something, but I really like the medium yellow. But I love green light. Although actually the one that I tend to use is the permanent green light from Reeves. And this is the Phoenix green light, which is sort of mossier in color. So I don't tend to use this one as much. So that's a good break. And then Cerulean Blue is one of my favorite colors. But again, looking at my chart, well, I, I suppose I do sometimes use the Phoenix Cerulean Blue. Well, here, I will show you instead of just mentioning these things. So you can see what I'm talking about. So this is the color chart that goes with this. And all I did to make this is take pencil and draw grids and then put each color that I use into its spot so I could keep track of what is what. So if I run out of this spot, I can just look at this chart and say, OK, I need to get some more Royal Wangle Rose. So these are the color names. And then also the little abbreviation says which brand, because I have a mix of brands that I use. So the pH is Phoenix. The MA is Marie's, and these are all uh, inexpensive brands that I happen to use for my paints. So none of these are break the bank kinds of uh, paints here. But the colors that I tend to use, if you've seen my paintings before, tend to be on the lighter pastel -y type. So I like the permanent green light, I like the cerulean blue, you know, I like the mauve. Those kinds of colors are the ones that I tend to gravitate towards. So the ones that I chose today are Marie's Gamboge, which is this one here, which is a nice, lovely, light yellow-orange color. The um, Phoenix Green Light. So see how that one's like got a bit of a mossy kind of feel to it? Marie's Green Light is different. It's more of like a stock green color. And the Reeves Permanent Green Light, which is one that I really like a lot, is a brighter color. You know, it's sort of hard to describe how colors differ from each other, but I'd say that was yellowier, maybe. And then on the cerulean blue, it was the uh, Phoenix cerulean blue, which is this one here, which is a deeper type of color than the Marie's cerulean blue. And I tried in these little squares to show how it goes from when it's lightly applied at the bottom to when it's more darkly applied. And you can see that some of them did do that, like the math of the Marie's green light, but some of them just stayed pretty the same, like this uh, Royal Langle Cobalt. So that's a different attribute of paints. So, you know, some of them are good at doing that kind of shading, and some of them just are less good the way that they tend to operate at doing the shading activity. So anyway, three colors generally in my normal usage range but still not quite the ones I tend to go for first. So this will be fun to see how they differ from other things that I tend to do. It's a good idea to make a color chart in general because the way that a color looks when it's dry can be fairly different. Like, I don't know how well you can see this, but the Royal Langle Rose right there looks sort of crimson when it's dry, but then it looks fairly bright pink when you put it on paper. And let's see what else. Like for this one here. So this looks again fairly much like a deep rose when it's dry. Because when you're looking 
trying to look through it when it's dry you're not looking through to anything it's just a solid hunk of uh, pigment when you're looking through this you're seeing through to the white of the paper and the lights bouncing back out at your eyeballs and that gives it a sort of glowing from the back look and it can make the color look fairly different so that rose on the paper looks fairly different than trying to look at the dry hunk of paint in the paint box so it's a good idea to make one of these it's fairly straightforward like i said just put grids on a piece of watercolor paper put down paint if you can try to make it darker on one side and lighter on the other so you get some sort of a sense of the range of uh, hues that it will give you when it's lighter versus darker but even if it doesn't end up doing that for you, it, it's really helpful to be able to look and see the different kinds of shades that you get out of each paint. Alright, so I'm going to put that over here so that I have it as a reference. Alright, so I have brushes, but while I have bunches of brushes, I really pretty much only ever use the brushes that are shaped like this. And I tend to just use a particular size, depending on how big my paper is. So I will tend to use, this is a 9. If I have something that's really tiny that I'm trying to get into for some reason, I might grab a littler one, like this is a 4. But I mostly just use one brush. You know, I have all these wide brushes, and maybe if I had a very specific thing I was trying to do, I would grab one. But generally, I don't. And the ones that have the stiff bristles, I'll use for spattering stuff on at the end. If I want to do a little spatter look. Sort of like this is one I did before with the dragon. And I like the spatter background just to give it a little visual interest. But I've been in a spatter mood recently. Could be that I would get tired of spattering things and move on to a different kind of mood. And also for water... It's good to have, oh, are mine mostly round? My brush set in general is all sorts of things. There are flat brushes and pointy brushes and everything else, but I tend to just use the rounds because the ends of the round brush are pointy. The side of it is straight, so you get everything that you need. But I mean, you should use whatever kind of brushes you like to use. Some people only work with flat brushes because they like those better. So it is all up to you and what you'd like to paint. Good questions, Anne, and thank you for hanging out and chatting. So Bob got me, because he is such a sweetie pie, a two bin water. This is just a cheap Tupperware. And it has two separate containers for water and the purpose for doing this is that you use one bin for rinsing all the paint off your brush when you're going to switch a color so that your brush is nice and clean and then you use another bin for getting fresh water to actually paint with and that way you're always painting with clean water and you have somewhere to rinse your brush off to get rid of all the old paint so previously i just had one giant bin for water and that meant that i was always using muddy dirty water to paint with which as you can imagine is not great for making <laughs> clean water colors when you are trying to put down fresh especially like you know a yellow or something that is fairly light so this kind of setup is a good idea if you're able to do it have one for rinsing off the brush and then another one for getting fresh water to work with all right so i'm going to make See, I normally <laughs> resist wiping off this stuff because I like having it available for doing other kinds of painting with. But we're doing a three-color challenge. You can see here from one of my previous ones, the orange, the blue, and the brown. Or maybe it was orange, blue, and red, I think. And then I mixed brown. Yeah, yeah, orange, blue, and red, because that's what the dragon was out of. Orange, blue, and red was last time. And then I mixed up browns out of that combination to work with. So, much as I hate to erase out these colors because I like to use them again and also I'm just generally frugal so I like being able to use colors until the very last little drop of color is used since even when watercolors dry out they are perfectly fine that's I mean all this stuff is dried out so I squish them in wet they dry out I just add water they get wet again they dry out and so on so anyway, I have three 
spots. On the downside, there's these ridges between them, which will make mixing a little harder, but that's okay. <laughs> it will be all right. All right, so put a little bit of blue. right there since it's not like we're going to use the other paints. A little bit of the green light. A little bit of the gamboge. Gamboge. Alright. to do. Alright, step one. The way I like to draw, at least right now, and I have like three <laughs> pencil sharpeners. I can't seem to figure out what I have done with any of them. one right here next to me. Alright, well, I will not hunt for it now. I will find it later. See if any of these pencils are a little sharper. Yep, this will be fine. Alright, what am I going to draw? So I tend to like to draw in pencil first because then you can erase and erase and erase until you use exactly what you want recommend having a nice eraser to work with because these erasers that come with pencils tend to be awful for some reason. don't know why you would think they'd give you a good eraser with a pencil. And then the second stage I'll use a waterproof ink. This happens to be a Sakura Jelly, Jelly Roll 06 but any waterproof ink is fine. It just needs to be waterproof because then when we get to the painting stage you don't want the water to smear the ink all over the place. Hey, good morning, Laura. Good to see you. All right, green, blue, and yellow. Now, my thought is to draw a frog on a lily pad in water, because I've got green and blue, and yellow can be, you know, lilies or something like that. But I am not currently well practiced in drawing frogs. See, I'm trying to not say that I am bad at doing things. It's better to say that I am still learning how to do some things. But if I Google frog, let's Google cute frog, since I tend to like cute things. Well, but I want something that actually looks sort of frog-like. Not like some sort of whoa. <laughs> you have to be careful what you Google <laughs> the kinds of things that you find. I won't even comment on the things that I'm finding. All right. Well, they have cute frogs with little crowns on their head. I'm sort of liking this idea. Alright, well let's see if I can draw this. Now also normally, I tend to draw things fairly two-dimensional looking and I get a cartoon kind of style. So how am I going to draw the scene for the frog and the lily pad, which is more of a three-dimensional kind of scene in general? Alright, well let's see. Let's start with the frog. Put the frog over here. Uh, remember when you're drawing things that a watercolor is going to need to be matted so it's going to have a layer of cardboard on all four sides to keep the watercolor paper from touching the glass in the front so it's sort of like a, a vertical spacer between the watercolor surface 
the cardboard mat and then the glass which sits on top. So you don't want to draw critical elements right to the edge of your paper. You always want to leave a margin where you have just tree or grass or background or whatever it is. But you don't want like the frog's eyeball right up against the side because that's going to end up being covered by the mat. And that would be a shame to lose part of your thing. So when you're laying out the composition of your drawing, put your main objects a little away from the edge of the paper. Alright, that's already a poor start. And I know when I was doing the cat before, I spent way too much time trying to get the cat to look cat-like. So I will not get that obsessed. I will accept that it will not be great, but it will be what it will be. I was doing this as an artwork I was going to give to someone and not recording myself. I would probably spend a lot more time working and reworking to make sure that I got everything just the way that I wanted to. But for a three color challenge, the idea is primarily to get a sense of what one would do with the colors. So while it's always good to Try to do your best with what you can. There's also a diminishing value in sitting there and obsessing too much. See, as I like, I see her and do it <laughs> about the exact shape at a particular time. All right, so there's three toes. I also have a bit of a tremor, so sometimes my hands do not exactly do what I would want them to do. Which, you know, people have many other larger challenges than I do, so I am appreciative of what I can do. Grateful that I have the time and the ability to do watercolors. And if my hands are a little shaky, I will use the eraser. Alright, that's a little off balance. Here, it looks like it's leaning a little too much. Alright, reasonably frog-like. You know, and I could, yeah, I'm, I'm being tempted here. <laughs> to try to fix things to make them more symmetrical. I just need to say it will do for now. Accurate for a frog prince, all right, I know it's... So is it down to this layer? All right, that's better. Better will be okay. All right, we got a frog. 
Hey Laura, it's good to have you playing along. I'm looking forward to the mannequin. Laura has this super cool mannequin that she is dressing up and putting makeup on and decorating and all sorts of really neat stuff. So you definitely want to see Laura from 1 to 3. And also look at her previous videos and watch them all. And make sure you like and subscribe on Facebook. You get her Facebook channel a bunch of subscribers. Because she is an amazing artist and very inspiring. Alright, so he is on a lily pad. over here. And again, remember to think about how things are going to be matted so you're going to lose the edges of it. So don't put anything right up close to where that edge is. And I'm going to put a lily. Although lilies don't really go on lily pads, do they? I suppose one could flop over onto a lily pad. Because normally, you know, they have stems that come up out of the water, so it's not like the stem would necessarily come right through the center of a lily pad. But one could say that this one flopped over onto the lily pad. Just so we could draw it this way. Let me see what does a lily and a lily pad look like. Got these petally things. Again, my aim is not to become a world expert in drawing lilies, but I want something that at least looks reasonably lily shaped. Right. Now I'm just erasing out the center line because the back side of the lily pad is going to be covered by the lily. That's a little small as a lily pad, you know, we give it a bit of a bigger lily to work with. So it looks a little more proportional. This is the benefit of mapping things out with pencil. You can play with things and see what you like. Uh, and then I say it's a little big. The frog is the main piece of interest. I don't want this to be this giant lily pad. Right, so we make the lily a little smaller. Make the lily pad a little smaller. Lily pad. Just put a horizon line back here at about the two thirds mark. In general, when you think about a painting, it's good to think about it in thirds because points of visual interest tend to fall on third lines like that. So the third lines, one of them happens to be falling on the frog's eyeball, which is lovely. Third lines. And it's good to keep blocks of stuff in the thirds area. So most of the content of this is in the center third. The top third is going to be the back distance, and the front third of it is going to be the front water. Alright, so we got a general sense of what we're doing here. And that at least gives us a layout for the just of what we're going to be up to. Alright, so once you've got a general pencil guideline set to work with, time to put in the pen. Remember, pen goes down wet as much as you think that it may dry instantly. It takes a little bit of time to dry. 
So it's good not to run your hand over things that you've just drawn in. Give it at least a few minutes to dry. Trying to give it a flattish bottom. trying to give a sense that there's some petals in the back, some in the front. So now I have to be careful not to be sliding my hand over that lily pad which I just put down and where the ink is still wet. Give it a chance to dry so it does not smear. So let me know in the comments if anyone else has chosen a set of colors, what colors are doing. Or if you're hanging out, that is lovely too. It's just nice to spend relaxing time together. Let's watch what we're up to. So that the world has some peace and calm in it. That is a good thing. So much of our health can be impacted by the level of stress or calm we have in life. The more relaxed and low stress you are, the better your body is able to heal and maintain itself and all that other kind of stuff. This makes everything so much easier. Okay, a froggy. Ways easier. Yeah, and if your hand is shaky, that's just part of the challenges of life. Just keep your hand grounded on the paper more often. Take breaks more often. For me, it helps to cut out caffeine. It also helps just to meditate and do yoga and keep calm in your life. Yeah. Most concerned about the eyes because this circle is a fairly challenging shape if you have shaky hands and also eyes tend to be what the person who is viewing the picture look right towards so if the eyes have a problem that tends to be noticed fairly quickly. And well pencil can be erased a lot harder to erase pen. Alright, let's put in this horizon now. And I'm specifically trying to make this back horizon line a little way because we are working in a nature setting where lines should be a little less sharp versus uh, buildings and concrete and that sort of stuff. All right. All right, so we got some bases here of objects. 
Alright, so next we're going to start up with the backgrounds. Scott Nelson, who is an amazing artist, sorry, who does all sorts of children's books and other things, has advised me in the past, in general, not as a rule, that it's useful to paint the backgrounds in first, because I used to paint the backgrounds in last and try to paint around my object. And he said in general that it helps to do the backgrounds first, so that you can think about handling the things that are not in focus and then focus in on the things that you want people to be looking at, like the frogs, and I find that is fairly helpful for me. Now on one hand, one would be tempted to put a blue sky in there, but on the other hand, I really want this to feel like you're up close and personal with the frog. And if you were down low by a pond, looking at the frog, that then probably what you would see in the background would not be the sky. You'd probably see grasses and stuff like that because you were right up close with the frog. So I think I'm going to do it that way because also the water is going to be blue and that lets the background be green and we can use the blue and green. Let me find my piece of cardboard. Here we go. I'm going to be painting right to the edges of the paper here. And I generally don't want to be painting on my desk directly. Alright, there we go. And that also takes care of that glare problem. Alright, so we're going to paint grassy things for the background. Now in general, it's a good idea to think about not painting directly with a watercolor color. Like I wouldn't necessarily want to take that green and just paint that whole background green because in nature, few things, <coughs> sorry, few things are one particular color. There are all sorts of different shades of things. And actually, you know what I didn't do, which I could do right now. So we're going to put Froggy to the side. I didn't do a color mix uh, ex experiment. It's a good idea when you start a three color challenge, sorry Froggy, to see what these colors look like on paper when they're mixing together because it gives you an idea of the range of options that you've got. So here I'll just sketch out the circles so that you can see what we're after. I'm just going to make three circles of color that all overlap. Right, those are rough circles. <laughs> the idea is that we're going to put green into one of these circles. And you can see how that's not the super bright green that I generally gravitate towards. Bright's the wrong word. Pastelli. We'll say pastelli green is what I tend to gravitate towards more than a mossier green. We want to see what happens when we have green and blue together. We're just going to make a green blue. So green, blue, pretty uh, unsurprisingly makes a green, blue. And then this is a, like I said, a sort of an orangey yellow. Orange, yellow, blue makes sort of a greenish color, which is a little darker than. Normal one, and then yellow green. 
sort of like a gray and then yellow, green, blue. Yeah, so we don't have a huge range of colors that we end up with here. Unlike some of our other trio combinations that gave us a bunch of other things that we could work with. Now mostly we've got yellow. We've got the blue and yellow make a green. We already had a green. The green and blue make a green blue. Here, if we do it just like right over here. Yeah, so it's really just a bit of a darker green. Darker green thing. We take a little bit of the yellow and the blue. That just makes another green. So we got lots of green things that we can make here. And then the yellow, green, blue just makes another green. So, all right, we got, you know, some things that we could work with. But it's good to do that at the beginning, just so you have a sense of what your color options are going to be when you work with these three colors all together. So, we have learned that we have yellow, blue, and green, 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 which we know is good for doing a meadowy scene. And I actually like this green better than I like the pure green like out of the phoenix because that has sort of a nice rich feel to it for me. So we're going to take some of this green and this yellow. So a benefit of mixing up your own color like this is that you get this range in different spots. Some of it's a little yellower, some of it's a little greener. So now when we're painting this, we are getting a mix. See how it's got like all sorts of different things going on in there? It makes it look more natural and like I would actually be in nature. That will be some darker spots. There'll be some lighter spots. Some spots that could be different kinds of leaves. We could add some other kinds of details into it, but this at least gives us that sense of a variety of foliage happening back there. I don't want this line to be too precise. As I have said before, I like the sense that this is a quick sketch, that you went out to this pond and you just sat there and sketched it, and that everything is loose and free, versus the precise style. And it's fine if you prefer a precise style, then that is okay. This is just the style that I happen to prefer. You want things? All right, well, I'll also comment on the curling paper. Um, you can pre-wet the paper so that it already has the curl uh, handled in it. Since, again, I like the rough, quick sketch style, I am all right with it curling a bit because that's just what paper does when you're out sketching with it. And it just means that the paint flows a little bit in different directions, which gives it again that loose free feel, which I am happy with versus unhappy with. If you prefer your paper to stay flat, then you can pre-wet it and you can also masking tape it or blue tape it down to your painting surface, like the cardboard in this case, to make sure that it stays perfectly flat so that it does exactly what you want it to do. So that is fully up to you. Um, so the other thing I was going to say is that the eye of the viewer tends to get drawn towards things that where they are very dark or very bright. So in general, for background scenes, you want to keep it more in the middle value, not too dark and not too light, in areas where you don't want the eye to be drawn to, because you don't want this pile of brush and plants and stuff in the background to be the key focus for this image. So you don't want this to be the darkest or the lightest area back here. This is just sort of supposed to be a gentle background, uh, out of focus area that provides an environment for the frog and the lily pad. So you don't want this to be the thing people are staring at. So I made this section right there a little 
too dark for my liking. So what I'm doing is getting my brush wet and just brushing at this a bit to dilute it. And when you use a wet brush on an area, it tends to pick up the paint that's there like a sponge. And then you can put that paint down somewhere else. So I don't want any bright white areas, which might grab the eye. And I don't want any super dark areas, which might grab the eye. Because this background stuff is just supposed to be random grassy things. And also, I might make it a little darker on the edges. Just so that the eye is drawn more in towards the center of things. Alright, so see how there's sort of a range of different colors of green, and I might toss in a little bit of this kind of green. So little highlight pieces. But the more that you create a range of a little bit yellower or a little bit greener, the more it starts to look more like a natural scene. Versus if you just grabbed a particular paint color out of your paint bin and did everything in that one color. Right. A few little stems. Right, everything is sort of thick. So here where I generally use all one thickness of brush, I might get a little tinier brush and go for something a little, just to make a couple of things in here. You see, even that doesn't look that much thinner, but at least it's a little bit thinner. And again, people are not going to be hopefully <laughs> staring at this back area, but you just want to give a general sense that there's some sort of a it's on your screen, like there's a bright spot there, but that's actually quite green, so it's just a reflection. Alright. Now I'm going to go through a little bit of darker color. And just make sure I got all the white out of this bottom area, because I do not want any splotches of white to grab the eye away from the frog. And it also gives me the opportunity to give a sense that there's like little low bushy things down here and to work in around the crown and so we're just again trying to eliminate any white spots because white spots will grab the eye Draw your eye into somewhere where it really shouldn't be getting drawn. This is just a background. <laughs> Let us not obsess over the background. Alright, next up. The water. When you are painting watercolors, an area that is wet, and then if you put another area that's wet right next to it, so in essence you have two ponds of water, when those touch they will tend to merge and flow, just like when we were doing our test sheet over here into a single pond, which is great if that's your intention to do that. But if you're doing something like this, where you have a green grassy area and then a blue pondy area, then you probably want to keep those two areas separate. So you want to be cautious when you go towards the edge where the two meet. I 
I'm starting down at the bottom. And again, I'm not being precise along the edges here on purpose because I enjoy a quick sketchy kind of feel to the things that I do. If you want to be more precise with what you're doing, that is fine. Your style is your own style, and you can paint however makes you happy. So again, you can see the paper is curling. In my case, I don't mind that. And if anything, I like that because it gives it that quick sketch feel for me. If you don't like your paper curling, you can tape it down and keep it in place. You can free wet your paper, which once you wet it and flatten it, then that will make it less likely to curl when you are painting. There are some artists who will say that they like the bottom area of their painting to be darker, to go up towards lighter and lighter as it goes up into what we will say is the distance, and that they say that it helps to build a sense of distance. So you can think about that if you want. It depends on how you've laid out your scene, whether that works for you, but it can work out well to have darker colors down on the bottom, and then have it go lighter as it heads up towards the top. So I want to be a little careful here as I reach this area so that I don't necessarily have all the green, which is still wet, of that background grass layer come swooping down into the blue. Now one could say that there will be reflections and all that other kind of stuff and the water near the shore will be a little thinner, so maybe you can see down into the mossy bottom. So it's not necessarily awful to have some green sliding over there, which you can see is happening. And then also with my style of liking to have things cross the lines, I don't mind it in general. But you wouldn't necessarily want a gigantic billow of green moving out into the middle of your pond area, so it's all about a balance. And see how it's doing some sort of like little ripply things due to the way that the water is moving and drying? I like that because this is a pond and I like having the sense that there's different shades of blue and the lights hitting it in different ways and all of that sort of stuff. So I am in general fine with that. Alright, so I think I've got all the blue filled in. Again, I don't want any bright spots of white anywhere that is just a random location because giant spots of white tend to draw the eye. And I don't want the eye to be drawn to just some random little spot on the side of the pond. They actually like the green coming down a little into the pond, so I like that kind of reflection feel to it. So I'm going to add a little more green in here along the edge of the pond. That sense that we're getting the reflection of the grasses on the pond surface. And then also I want a little more blue out here, but let's add a little yellow to it maybe, which will make green again, as if we don't have enough green in this thing. But again, I like having a little bit of Lots of reflections of things. With all the green around here, it makes sense that green would be reflected in the scene. Put a little blue on here. So 
again, in nature, things are rarely just one color. Get some reflection from the sky. We get some reflection from the frog, reflections from the grass, and so on. And then trying to eliminate any white splotches. That might draw the eye in a little too much. I'm also trying not to have too sharp of an edge out here in the pond because this is supposed to be a natural pond. Natural ponds don't tend to have too many sharp edges. There's going to be some with the edges of a lily pad and such, but in the water, try to keep it a little softer. So, look, the darkness looks a little more extreme on the camera version than in my in-person version, but it is a slightly bit darker on the bottom and then goes back towards the lighter, and then the background gets a little darker again. I might have made that background a little lighter even as I starting from scratch, but now the aim will be to make these two main things a better contrast of very dark and very light and that should make them pop out from all of this background stuff that we've just been putting in. And again, you're, you're seeing some sort of a bright glare. Let's see if we drop the light intensity down a little. If that reduces that bright glare of it. See, unfortunately, the uh, cell phone camera keeps adjusting for the things that I do. So even when I drop the light, it sits there and readjusts it to try to show it in the same contrast. But that's all right. Alright, let's do the back lily next so that we can get a sense of what we are heading towards. And once again, as I'm looking at that green light, it's just a little mossy colored compared to what I generally like to do. And I like much better the color that I get when I mix a little bit of the yellow in with the blue, maybe a bit of the green, so not only is that green more interesting to me in general as a color, but I like that you still have bits of bluer area and yellower area because it gives it more of a realistic sense to me that this is an actual object in nature that has highlights and things versus just a stuck single color out of a tube. And again, around the edges I do not want bright white showing up anywhere where it would catch the eye and make you pay attention to the edge of a lily pad, which is not the key focus of this scene here. And you can see with the brush strokes, I'm able to create some texture. So in general, I want to put the brush strokes in the direction that I think that the components of the object are going to flow. So in this case, the lily pad. So I'm trying to create brush strokes that go in a generally roundy shape, which is the way a lily pad throws with its rings. Because people will see those brush strokes and it forms part of the texture of the object. Alright, so see that we've got the curls of the lily pad. Just a little bit of white out there. Bits of white off the edges. Alright, let's do the other one while we've got some nice wet paint. So 
I don't know if you can see there on the camera, but there are actual little bits of yellow and little bits of blue. So I did not mix this thoroughly on purpose because I wanted to have that kind of texture that there are some areas that are a little darker, some areas that are a little lighter to create a nice sense of texture. Some a little yellower. Even with a two-dimensional cartoon type of thing, you still want to think about where the light is coming from in your scene. And in general, I tend to have the light coming from the top right corner, which would mean things in the top right of sections of an object, which are the top right of that object, should be a little lighter and brighter and things in the lower area should, in general, be a little shadowier. So we'll take a look at that in a second. Once we have finished. So you in general want to ground objects with a shadow that makes them feel more connected to the environment they're in. So if you put a little bit of shadow underneath, the object in question helps it make it feel a little more like it's in the same space as that object. That movie cut is already fairly dark. Maybe if we add a little blue in there, give it some sort of a shadowing. Good to remember that watercolors tend to lighten as they dry, so it's good to put on multiple light levels to see what the impact is, rather than trying to put on one heavy level and see if that's going to work or not work for you. So you can put on just a little light shadowing, let it dry, see how it looks, add a little more light shadowing. Let it dry, see how it looks, and so on. So it's a building up of layers. Get the overall impact that you're looking for. And you might think that once you put water color pigment down, that it is down for life, but you can completely clean your brush, make it wet, and then use it to gently scrape away the paint and lift it up. So if you end up needing to do that, it is a possibility. It depends what kind of paper you have. A uh, less expensive paper will have more trouble with that than a more expensive paper in general. You can see I just took some water 
I made my brush clean and now I'm able to lift away the paint a little bit. Make a little bit of highlight there. So again I just clean the brush, get it a bit damp, and then pull a little of the paint away there. Give a little bit of a highlight. green strokes. So I have some green on the brush. A little more texture back there. Alright, while the lily pads are wet, it would be sort of dangerous to paint anything that touches those lily pads because the paint that is wet in the lily pad area could then flow into whatever new thing I was painting and create a mush but it should be safe to paint the froggy eyeball pupils since that is not touching anything at all. I'll get some black. Get these black eyeballs in. a chance to dry. I think I should be safe working on his crown. Ah! Wait, I used black. <laughs> oh, well, I suppose I could have drawn them in with ink. See, that's what happens. I guess I'm used to doing black. I could have drawn them in with the black ink and made them black ink eyeballs. So I apologize <laughs> for the black paint eyeballs. You could say black really isn't the color since I said that white wasn't going to be a color. So, <laughs> But still. Should have done it with ink. It will be all right. All right, so back to the yellow for the crown. Just be careful where I put my hand down. I've got a lot of wet things here on my painting. That's looking fairly boring, we'll say. I could add in details with a pen, which I think I may end up doing once that dries. Because I'm not sure what I could do with the blue or green. I could add little dollops of blue, like he has blue gemstones in there, and I may still do that. But I need this yellow, <coughs> geez, sorry, I need this yellow to dry before I do anything like that. Otherwise, anything I add that's blue will just make it turn green. And we have more than enough green in this picture already. All right, so now he's got a gold crown. All right, I think... Enough of this lily pad is dry. This is where one starts taking risks, but we are trying to paint reasonably quickly. So, I'm going to let this lily over here get a first coat. Now, especially with something like a lily, you would probably want to do multiple coats in here where you have some areas that are lighter and some areas that are darker, just like a real lily in real life would be. When you look at a flower in the wild, it doesn't tend to be 
all one color. If you look at it carefully, there tend to be some areas that are a little lighter, and some that are a little darker, and sometimes it's the light that's causing that effect, and sometimes the flower itself has different shades, or depending if you can see through the petal or not see through the petal. So it's good to give that kind of sense that this is something out in nature. And I'm being cautious as I get near the lily pad because that is still wet and I do not want giant green swaths of color billowing out into my lily just because I'm trying to get this done quickly. Alright, I think I was safe -ish. to paint the things that are closer to me in a richer color and then as things get further into background have them be a less rich color so that they sort of fade into the background and give it a bit of a three-dimensional effect. In general most of this is done in a fairly 2D cartoon effect but it's still good to have a little bit of dimensionality to your image to give it that sense that this could be real even in a cartoon kind of sense of real and again maybe I'll mix a little tiny bit of green over here on just the left so that it has that little bit of sense of shadow along the left hand side And then a little bit of sense of shadow down along the bottom. And there are a few little hairs in there that I can deal with that at the end. The hairs can just get swept away. And I'll put a little bit of shadowing along the left edges of some of these petals. And again, we're talking about just little subtle things. Hopefully the eye picks up on. Alright. So now we've got some lily pad stuff going on there. Alright, now to the main frog. The frog is on a green lily pad, so you don't want to paint the frog the exact same color as the green lily pad because then he's just going to blend in against the green lily pad. You want him to stand out a bit. So I think I may make him more of a bluer frog with a hint of green. Maybe a hint of yellow. There we go. Try to get him to stand out from all of these other shades of green that are in here. To work on differentiating his body parts next but first I want to put down a base layer where at least he is all a cer certain color so I can take a look at that and see how that looks against the rest of the scene and see if this is a color that I need to adjust because I could put down this base color and then say, oh, it needs to be bluer, and then I could add in a little blue and paint that over, or I could say it needs to be a little yellower and add that in. So the nice thing about watercolors with the layers is that you can sit there and adjust things and adjust things within reason. You probably can't make something blue easily turn into a red, but you can make it a little darker, 
And see up here I'm a little worried it's blending too much into the background. So in a second I will adjust it, but let me get through this first layer. And to be careful around the eyes, not to get into the eye whites. Alright, so see when I go near the blue, I think it needs to be a little greener. I have to be careful though, because down near the green lily pad, I don't want it to be too green. And then get too blended in with the green of the lily pad. This frog has to stand out in both areas, because he is the main focus of the image. Alright, so let's make him a tiny bit greener, greener. I also love this dappled watercolor effect in general, where it's not all just one color, but it's got these ranges of colors going on. So that's part of what I enjoy about watercolors. Alright, so in general I want his forward features, like his chest and stuff, to be lighter. And I want his belly like to have a light splotch on there. So I want his back legs to be a little darker. And again, I don't have to do this all at once. I can let this dry and then come back and do another layer. Let that dry and do another layer. I'm going to sure I pull out or cover up any bright white spots. Because I don't want those white spots to draw the eye. And a little bit of shadow under the crown. So the crown feels connected to the head. Be careful around the eye. Right, so I need some differentiation between the different legs. Generally, I want things that are further in the background to be a little darker or muted. -er. I know sometimes you want them lighter, like in this case, but in this case where they are both in the same zone, you know, connected to each other. I like the things in the back to be a little darker as if they're a little more in shadow. So it depends on the situation that you're painting, how you approach creating a distinction between the things closer and the things further away. Just trying to get that top knee area to not have the darker water settle into it. Left side of him is a little more in shadow. Under the crown, should have a little bit of shadow. A little ridge there for that eye. A little shadow along his crown. A little shadow along that neck. Some of these details you need to wait until the first layer dries 
so that you can put in a second layer and so on. All right, so this lily is nice and dark, but it also feels a little too dark to me. Like it's drawing the attention too much from the frog. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wet my brush and I'm going to drag it along in here. And when you drag it when it's wet, I'm just scraping off the excess paint. You can see how much paint is coming off when I'm doing this. It is lifting up the paint into the brush and then I'm just able to scrape it off. So that will then lighten it. I'm leaving paint at the edges to create shadow. I'm leaving it underneath the lily to create shadow. And I hope in general is to make this lily lighter so that it's less the focal point and it's just a dark thing in the background. On one hand that's a little better, on the other hand that contrast still draws the eye. So I think I even need to lighten up these edge pieces so that we don't have that sharp contrast which pulls the eye over here. Because we want this to be a supporting character in our scene and not a featured star character. So we'll put some of that lifted up from here, put it in over here. So the more contrast we can give this main lily pad, the more it becomes the star character. That's a little better. And a little more darker shadow. Under the frog. I still think it's a little too much contrast back here. Just drawing the eye. I'm just trying to lift some of the paint from around the edges so it's not quite as sharp and contrasty. Lift some of the paint from underneath. Well, I've got this paint anyway on my brush, I might as well put it down over in the area that I am trying to draw the attention to. over here. So how 
could we make him more of a contrast of light and dark? We can make his belly lighter, so I'm rinsing my brush well. I'm going to scrub away at his belly a little more. Lift out some of this blue to make this even lighter in color. Because a big white spot will draw the eye. Alright, so that's lighter. And now we're going to make the legs a little darker. And again, we have to be sort of careful because we don't want it to blend wholly into this lily pad that it's sitting on. So it has to be dark but distinct from the lily pad. Nice contrast, so it draws the eye. But still have sections that look like the front, sections that look like it's further in the back. dark along the edges here. Dark along the edges here. Dark along the edges here. Getting a little better. This face here is still a little light. It's not quite that light in reality. But I think I want to darken it up with a more saturated color because that'll make the white and the dark of his eyes stand out more to have the dark area, and then the white eyes, and then the dark center area. So much about the way we perceive the world depends on what the colors are near. Something will look bluer or redder or so on based on what other colors are around them. So you have to think not only about the color you're working with, but the colors that are in the vicinity and how they're going to affect the perception of that color. And it's something the more that you paint, the more you get a sense of that. So a lot of it is just practicing. Practicing and seeing what works, what happens, and so on. It's odd that on the screen it still looks like it's shiny under the face, but that's just the way the screen goes sometimes. Alright, I think I'm going to put a tiny bit of shadow on the left side of the petals. little sense of dimension there. And the 
back areas should be a little duller so they don't catch the light as much. So a little further away and in shadow when you think. Some little blue gemstones on his crown. Nice blue gemstone in the middle. a little better, a little more crowny looking. I suppose while we've got blue, we want the background not to be too eye-catching, but we can put some little blue flowers in here. I tend to put the background flowers symmetrically, which sort of ruins the impression that they are just haphazardly in here. So I have to try to focus on being more free and loose. I could do all sorts of other things to this, and some of it would have to be done after it dried. But I think you get the general sense of the scene for a first pass at least. Yep, see, I can see her picking away at it non stop. But the purpose of this exercise is just to give you a quick general sense of things you can do. And then you can sit there and add details and add details and so on for quite a while. Alright, so that's a general sense of how to make a frog on a lily pad in blue water with a grassy background when your colors that you have available are cerulean blue, green, light, and gamboge. So that is one set of colors. Let's see, what if we put this here? And I think that this one is a case where I will add a spattering. Although, you know, I really like spattering things, so maybe I should add a spattering to all of these. I'm going to rinse off my brushes first. Up there. Spattering gets everywhere. Yeah, I'll leave those out. So it's good to have cardboard or something down before you do this. I'll start with the frog since the frog went first. It's good to have the picture part fairly dry before you spatter things on top of it so that the spattering colors stay nice and crisp and don't merge down into the the paints that are down there before. Alright, so spattering is done well with a stiff brush so you can flick it and the little colors spray out over everything. And it's a balance that you want the brush wet. If you get it too wet, then you'll make giant thin droplets. If it's too dry, then you might have thick gobs. So it's all a bit of trial and error to see what you like. You can practice on you know, just regular plain paper and see what kind of spatters you enjoy. So, you will find out. I 
And actually, I will do this little assembly line while I've got blue on here. I'm going to do blue. Oh, three. Especially for this flowers where I didn't have a blue sky in there, the spattering gets that nice sense of the blue sky going on there. Alright, so I've done all the blue that I'm of mind to do. Rinse that off. Get my brush nice and clean. I'm going to go on to green. Make sure I don't have any giant globs that are going to come out. Ah, see, I kind of did it anyway. Alright, get some green in there. Well, if you're always being careful about blobs. Alright, so I'll just brush that blob into the scene. So we've got green there. Green there. Off the green. Hey Laura, good to see you. Thank you. Just finishing up. A little yellow. Froggy picture. And yellow for the flowers. Because it looks sort of like a flowery splash. It was not so bad. Alrighty. Always rinse your brushes out when you're done. Store them upright like that they can store without getting squished or bent. I just type in my thank you. Alright, so again to summarize, this was a random three color challenge. I drew randomly out of a bin the colors Gamboge, Green Light, and Cerulean Blue. So those are the only three colors I had to work with. 
I put those colors down. I was able to mix them to make some other kinds of greens, but mostly all I could make was greens, greens, and more greens out of those colors. So I came up with some sorts of designs that I could create that would work well with greens, yellows, and blues. So the idea is just to let your mind be loose, be creative, be relaxed, have some fun, and learn more about color mixing and how things work together and so on. So let me know if you have any questions. Certainly give this a try yourself. Draw some random colors out of your crayons or colored pencils or whatever you work with and see what you can do with them. And I'd love to see the results that you create. Have a wonderful afternoon and enjoy your creativity. So next up on this Saturday morning, we have Laura O. Senadella doing Facebook Live. So go on to Facebook Live and look for Laura O. Senadella, or I will put a link on the Blackstone Valley Art Association page so that you can find it easily. So I will type that in the chat as well. Next up for this afternoon, we have fantastic artist Laura. Sanabella taking live from her studio on her Facebook page. I'll post a link. Be sure to watch. She is amazing. Alright, everybody, let me know if you have any questions. I am happy to help. We all support each other. Just let your mind go and have fun. The key to it is to have fun, relax, and the more you paint, the more you'll develop your own style and head in a direction that makes you happy. So have a great afternoon.